welcome back to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming your way. Uh, and I'm serious when I say jam-packed. We've got a lot of stuff that we're going to be covering today because there's been a lot of stuff going on in the news cycles because, you know, the... It's just one of those weeks where everything is really, really busy. And as a result, we're going to try to make a little bit of sense of some of this stuff for you. Uh, we're going to start with our Prager University segment, and it has to deal with the American media and comparing that with the Soviet-style tactics. So here's Prager University. The communist government of the former Soviet Union thought that by controlling access to information, they could keep their citizens in line. Consistent with the Orwellian nature of the Soviet Union, the country's most important newspaper was Pravda. Pravda is the Russian word for truth. But Pravda was not truth. It was full of lies. But here's the thing. Almost no one in the Soviet Union was fooled. They knew they were being lied to. Ironically, unlike most citizens in the Soviet Union, citizens in 21st century America are fooled by their news media. We think we're getting the real story from our major media, but we're not. When we tune into the networks or read the New York Times or the Washington Post, we're actually getting a sharply slanted version of the news, slanted to the left. This should deeply concern people on both sides of the political divide. To make informed decisions, a free society needs a press it can trust, not one that is hopelessly biased. In 2017, Project Veritas sent out undercover reporters to see how committed the major media was to objective news gathering, specifically as it regarded the newly elected president, Donald Trump. Our first report focused on CNN. A producer there, John Bonifield, acknowledged the lack of evidence for his network's efforts to link the Trump campaign and the Russian government in a plot to rig the 2016 election. Bonifield told us, I think the president is probably right to say, like, look, you are witch hunting me. You have no smoking gun. You have no real proof. So why was CNN so relentless in hammering the Russia collusion narrative? Ideology, the election wasn't legitimate, and ratings. As Bonifield noted, the Trump-Russia collusion story was good for business. Next, we released another series of reports, these on the New York Times. First, we heard from Nick Dudick, the paper's audience strategy editor. Dudick told our undercover reporter he was responsible for choosing which New York Times videos go on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Dudick boasted, my imprint is on every video we do. And what was that imprint about? As Dudick, who worked on both the Obama and Hillary Clinton campaigns, told our reporter, he hoped to use his position to make the president's life as difficult as possible. I will be objective, he told our reporter with undisguised sarcasm before revealing his true intentions. No, I'm not. That's why I'm here. Dudick told us he returned to journalism precisely in order to remain politically active. Next, we met Des Shu, an editor for the paper. She made it clear where she stood. I think one of the things that maybe journalists were thinking about is like, oh, if we write about Trump and how insanely crazy he is and how ludicrous his policies are, then maybe people will read it and be like, oh, wow, we shouldn't vote for him. According to the Times' own handbook on journalistic ethics, journalists may not do anything that damages the Times' reputation for strict neutrality in reporting on politics and government. So given such a breach of the Times' own standards, we expected the newspaper to come down hard on Dudik and Shu. Instead, they came down hard on us. Executive editor Dean Baquet said I was a despicable person for recording one of his employees telling the truth. Yet, when the Times publicized a 2012 undercover video of Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney saying that 47% of Americans wouldn't vote for him because they were dependent on the government, they praised it as offering a rare glimpse of Romney's personal views. In fact, 
In his attack on us, Baquet unwittingly gave the whole American media game away. A real journalist, he told a panel at the National Press Club, has to have in his or her heart a desire to make society better. The Times' editor is wrong. Real journalists want to pursue the truth. Then they let the citizens use that truth to build a better society. When journalists shape news to fit their vision of a better society, they're not doing their job. Perhaps this wouldn't be so bad if the major media would just admit their political motives. But they don't. On behalf of their own narrow agenda, they lie, distort, and exaggerate. And they expect us to call it Pravda. But with each passing day, fewer and fewer Americans are willing to do so. I'm James O'Keefe, founder and president of Project Veritas. For Prager, and it is the bias in the mainstream media that it also includes newspapers here in the Twin Cities. I used to work for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. I was not in the editorial position. I was in a classified advertising position, a different aspect of the paper. But I noticed that that trend was happening 20 years ago when I was working there. Uh, we were seeing more and more editorial, you know, slanted writing coming across in the um, in the actual stories. Now, I have been, I am a uh, graduate of the Defense Information School basic journalist course and their editor's course and their supervisor's course and their intermediate photojournalist course. The thing that I was always taught as a young journalist for the Department of Defense was keep your opinion on the opinion pages and keep yourself out of the story and tell both sides. That's how I was trained. That's how most of your military journalists uh, still operate. And, and when, I, when I say uh, still, I'm talking not just about those still in uniform, but those who are no longer in uniform who are still doing that kind of work in society today. But that differs from what we're seeing in the uh, major media today. Now, I bring this up because one of the people that I have looked up to as far as a model uh, in, in how I even try to present information to you is Charles Krauthammer. And the longtime uh, reporter and Fox News contributor had passed away recently uh, after a protracted battle with cancer. And the one thing I appreciated about Charles Krauthammer was the fact that he tried to know as much as he could about topics, so he had a command, a strong command of the facts and a strong knowledge base from which to articulate his position. And he did not care if you were a liberal or a conservative, to use those as the end of the scale. He wanted to look at what is the truth and let's talk about the truth. And Crownheimer admits, sometime, admitted, sometimes he was wrong about things. But at the time he would say things, that's what the facts had shown. And we are going to look right now at an interview with uh, the late Charles Krauthammer uh, titled, A Failure to Recognize Evil. Vietnam poisoned uh, liberalism's view of America and American exceptionalism, American goodness, mm -hmm. the benignity of America, basically coming out, if you like, of the Second World War. Uh, and all the good that we had done in the world. So that was sort of a turning against America as a moral exemplar. And I do think they felt that we had lost the mandate of heaven. Let's talk a little bit about American foreign policy. Uh, you haven't uh, changed much on the foreign policy front, at least not as much as you've changed your views on domestic policy, as you your, yourself admit uh, in your book. W what happened to liberal foreign policy? What happened to liberal anti-communism and the party of Scoop Jackson and so forth? Well, I know they sort of sailed away. They gave up on the, I mean, they're used, people don't know this, but don't remember. Uh, but in the mid, by the mid-70s, there was still a very 
significant part of the Democratic Party that was rather conservative on foreign policy. It went by various names, Coalition for a Democratic Majority. People like, as you say, Scoop Jackson, uh, Paul Nitze, mm -hmm. Pat Moynihan, uh, they were, you know, unblinking social democratic great society, liberals and domestic, but they had no illusions about evil. Uh, and that they have disappeared. The Democratic Party, one by one, either they decided to abandon that, mm -hmm. they left the, the last of the Mohicans really is Joe Lieberman and the fact that he's had to leave the party was pushed out as sort of a symbol of how the, the, the Democrats gave up on the Cold War. They love to say, oh, the Cold War was a time when we all agreed. <laughs> Everything was so simple. Clinton right. used to say that. All agreed. I was in every one of the fights in the 80s. Yeah. They fought tooth and nail against every Reagan policy, and they were wrong on every single one, starting with the freeze, starting with the buildup, starting with strategic defenses, starting with what I call the Reagan doctrine, which is supporting anti-communist guerrillas, starting everywhere. And they, they walk around saying, oh, no, it was so easy and we got it right. They got it wrong. They were unwilling to recognize evil and to do something about facing it down. And that's the same problem that we have today. A Barack Obama, who won't even say the words radical Islam, who won't identify the enemy, and who thinks, for example, as we speak today, uh, that he can make a detente, uh, some kind of philosophical arrangement, and joint hegemonic uh, presence in the Middle East with Iran. People where the leader chants death to America, and where they're building intercontinental ballistic missiles, which I can assure you, you don't need if you're an Iranian to hit Tel Aviv. That's not intercontinental distance. That's a short-term rocket. ICBMs are hitting other continents, meaning hitting us. And that's the same philosophical strain that uh, I'm afraid has afflicted the Democrats since the Vietnam War, when that part of the party, the John Kennedy part, the Hubert Humphrey mm -hmm. part, uh, the Harry Truman part, which was we will bear any burden. And that was less important in the end of that sentence, this is Kennedy's inaugural address, uh, to secure the survival of liberty. And that was their credo, and they gave it up after Vietnam. Was it, was it just Vietnam that, the, the, that anti-communist uh, sentiment in the party um, you know, hit the shoals of, on, or was there something else going on um, that, uh, that with Vietnam, or that took advantage of Vietnam to move the party away from its historic uh, I think situation? That's a very good point. Vietnam was sort of the central issue and the symbol and the embodiment, but it was a larger issue. Vietnam poisoned uh, liberalism's view of America and American exceptionalism, American goodness, mm -hmm. the benignity of America, basically coming out, if you like, of the Second World War uh, and all the good that we had done in the world. So that was sort of a turning against America as a moral exemplar. And I do think they felt that we had lost the mandate of heaven. Mm -hmm. We had lost the moral authority to be the hegemonic nation that we were and largely still are. Uh, and therefore, or to put down the mantle, it was a kind of a disgust with that position, and that we were doing more harm than good, Vietnam being the example. So it was a turning against the culture. That's why it was called the counterculture, turning against Americanism. And where did that come from? Is that from the campuses? May we blame them, or is it something no. else? I don't know that it, the campuses had that much influence. The campuses sort of captured the feeling Certainly the adults who should have known the better acquiesced to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they felt it, but uh, I would put it in a slightly other way. It was generational. Mm -hmm. That generation, which were the children of the greatest generation, sort of, uh, it was a revolt against their parents, mm -hmm. what was seen as the bland 50s, what was seen as the stasis, what was seen as kind of a smug satisfaction. Uh, and, you know, the idea of the greatest generation as an invention of the 80s and the 90s of the Reagan era certainly wasn't around the 60s and 70s. Uh, so whether the actual student culture created it, I don't know. 
It was a large part of it, but certainly the adults collaborated. The Democratic Party was run by adults, not children, and they nominated McGovern. It wasn't a student council election, it was a presidential <laughs> election. And that is the late Charles Krauthammer. He is already missed. I really would have liked to have uh, heard what his viewpoint is on the uh, upcoming Supreme Court vacancy, which, of course, we will actually be discussing in a little bit. Uh, but farewell to Charles Krauthammer, and for those of us who watched you, uh, you definitely gave us something to emulate. And I also want to say thank you to the Claremont Institute for their video, and if you wanted to see more of those styles of videos, go to YouTube and check out their Great Minds channel. Uh, and of course, while you're at YouTube, don't forget to check our past archives, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. Uh, we are now going to take a look, speaking of the uh, Cold War and World War II, uh, President Trump uh, the other day actually had presented a posthumous Medal of Honor. Here is a snippet from that ceremony. Today we tell the story of an incredible hero who defended our nation in World War II, First Lieutenant Garland Merle Connor. Although he died 20 years ago today, he takes his rightful place in the eternal chronicle of American valor. And that, as you know, is what this is. This is the great, great men and women. It's American valor. He volunteered to go to the front line and observe the enemy and to help direct fire. In order to communicate with the command post, he took a telephone and hundreds of yards of telephone wire, and he laid down in this hole, this shallow ditch, where they could still see him. It was only one foot deep. In front of the lone American soldier were six German tanks and hundreds of German soldiers. As bullets flew all around him, Lieutenant Connor directed artillery fire, each time successfully decimating the enemy. They knew he was there, and they couldn't get him. Lieutenant Garland M. Connor distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity while serving with Company K, 3rd Battalion, 7th Inf Infantry Regiment. And so it's uh, nice to see somebody else get the recognition for his uh, military service. And I'm actually just trying to take a quick look here. Uh, Well, I'm not going to get too much into I didn't get a chance to look at uh, Lieutenant Connor's uh, service record before I began the show today. So I was just going to see if there was anything that I could uh, you know, take a closer look at. But uh, I'm going to need more time, so we're just going to move on to the next thing. Speaking of American media and Soviet-style tactics, let's take a look now at a story that is probably going to get some traction in the near future. And this is... Um, for members of the U.S. House of Representatives calling for Stephen Miller, who is one of the top advisors to President Trump, to resign. Now, before we show the video, uh, the thing about Stephen Miller is that he is actually probably one of the most polarizing figures in the Trump White House right now. And his big policy initiative is immigration. And when you talk about all of the controversy surrounding immigration, Stephen Miller actually has his fingers in that. Um, I'm actually kind of in agreement with the House members that if there's any one Trump uh, official, non-cabinet official, who really needs to resign, a policy person, it would be Stephen Miller. Uh, I do not, I mean... I, in a way, you got to admire the man because he is fighting back like the Democrats. Stephen Miller is doing a slash-and-burn, winner-take-all strategy. 
But at the same time, I don't think he has, I, I just don't think he's got the grasp of the pulse of the American people uh, on immigration. And I do think that uh, Miller needs to, I, I just don't think he's mature enough to handle the role that he's in. So anyhow, House members are calling for Stephen Miller to resign. This is a story that is probably going to get some traction in the next few weeks. Um, I don't expect to see any big bombshell like next week or the week after. But don't be surprised if that drumbeat starts to sound a little bit louder. You heard it here first. So let's take a look at what a couple of members of the House of Representatives had to say. One Democrat, one Republican. We're putting American families first on immigration. I think that Stephen Miller ought to, ought to be fired. He's, he's certainly a, a hardliner uh, when it comes to immigration issues. But I think the problem is uh, that there has to be some element of compromise here. Uh, and whenever you talk about young DACA people, the, the young people in the DACA program, uh, again, who were taken to this country illegally as children, who grew up here, who went to school here, who oftentimes know of no other country uh, but this country, uh, that, that, that that's an element of compromise uh, I think he's unwilling to do. I think the president just has to clean house. Otherwise, we're never going to get anything done on this issue. The notion that you think that this is a racist bill is so wrong and so insulting. And I think most people's perception is the hardest line ideologue on the R side is Stephen Miller. That he is the big obstacle at the White House to doing anything that moderate people from both sides would agree moves the, the debate forward, helps the dreamer kids, makes progress on immigration. So yeah, I would absolutely think he needs to go. Well, the and like I say, don't be surprised to actually see this pop up more and more as a news story. And when you start seeing just a couple of members of Congress, especially when you have bipartisan support on something, and it actually hits the Associated Press, it's going to start picking up. So I'm get, kind of giving you this more as a heads up that you've heard it here first, that this is going to be a story. Uh, the Supreme Court ended its... Uh, June term. Uh, they will, they've now adjourned until uh, October. They came out with one key ruling. They came out with a bunch of key rulings. As a matter of fact, uh, last week or the week before, we actually covered one of the key rulings in uh, Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky, who were, you know, right here on the day it, you know, when we were getting ready for the show that was announced. The Associated Press ruled on the um, on President Trump's travel ban. And if you recall that right after becoming president, the president had uh, made a ban against uh, importing people from, I believe it was eight countries, uh, mainly from the Middle East, uh, for national security reasons. And that was challenged by opponents and brought to the Supreme Court, and they announced their decision. And so what exactly did they say? Well, the Supreme Court issued a major ruling today on presidential power, upholding President Trump's travel ban against challenges that it violated immigration law and that it violated the Constitution because it discriminated against Muslims. The court's five conservatives were in the majority, and Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the opinion that said that the president has substantial authority under immigration law that would allow his uh, travel policy to be enforced, and also that the court did not find that it violated the Constitution because of any religious bias. The four liberal justices uh, were in dissent, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor uh, read a summary of her dissent from the bench, an impassioned dissent, in which she said that today's decision was a mistake of historic proportions. She likened it to a very unpopular Supreme Court decision during World War II that allowed for the internment of Japanese Americans uh, during the Roosevelt administration and the Second World War. She said today's decision was like that. The Chief Justice said nothing of the sort. 
Uh, that decision was wrong when it was issued and it's wrong today, and it has nothing to do with what the court decided today. The conservatives on the court did not endorse uh, the president's uh, statements uh, that he made both during the campaign and in the White House that some have uh, interpreted as being uh, anti-Muslim, including when he said during the campaign that he called for a complete and total shutdown of the entry of Muslims into the United States. The Chief Justice said the court was not endorsing um, such statements. Uh, he also said that, um, that uh, some presidents had used their office to uh, inspire uh, religious tolerance, uh, but that not every president had done so. And while he, he didn't specifically criticize Trump, he also said that was not the court's mission today. It was to determine whether the policy that the president laid out was lawful. And again, the court's five conservatives said that it was. And so that is what they had ruled. So the ban stays. Uh, of course, there were people who are not happy with that. So let's look at the viewpoints from some of those who had opposed the Supreme Court's ruling. So I just want to send the message to my community in particular that no court decides the parameters of our community's humanity. Yes. We will continue to resist. We will continue to fight. There is no justice in the halls of justice today. We saw a Supreme Court totally look at vetting and try to frame this in the way of President Trump rather than take this for what it is countries that are 90 to 99 percent Muslim and having a religious test for entry into our country. And I never thought I would stand on the steps of the Supreme Court and hear the most fundamental pillar of our Constitution, freedom of religion challenge. It is wrong. That's right. Today, I am here to challenge the U.S. Supreme Court and to say to the U.S. Supreme Court, this is a shameful moment in our nation's history. We're going to keep fighting with all of your support because we will not be banned. No ban, no wall, 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 no ban, no wall. I am outraged simply outraged by the court's decision today. The court has given a green light to the President of the United States to discriminate against a group of people based on their faith. And make no mistake about it, this impacts Americans here at home. Today's Supreme Okay, so now let's get this straight. For Na, uh, Nadia Velazquez, Barbara Lee, Debbie uh, Dingle. There's no justice in the halls of justice. And, and that, that activist at the very, very beginning, that no court will tell us this. I think the activist and the Democrat members of Congress who you just saw there, they should actually um, go back to reading Article 3, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. The, quote, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made, or which shall be made under their authority to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and cons consuls, to all cases of admir admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, blah, 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 blah. And um, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. Did members of Congress read Article 3, Section 2 of the United States Constitution? I have a feeling that they might want to revisit that because it would just verify how wrong they are. That yes, the um, justice has been served simply because the Supreme Court ruled. Now, there have been plenty of rulings in the Supreme Court that I don't personally agree with, but the fact is justice is still served simply because the nine members of the Supreme Court, per Article 3, Section 2, have the power to decree what justice is. 
So no court, no, excuse me, activist, uh, the Supreme Court just said you don't, you know, your viewpoint is invalid. So anyhow, oh, now that we saw what the Democrats had to say, let's take a we'll look at what CARE was a committee for uh, American Islamic relations. What does CARE have to say about the Supreme Court travel ban decision? Today's Supreme Court's decision is extremely disappointing. Disappointing to Muslims and to all Americans and all people who believe in equal protection and equality. The Supreme Court's decision today has given the Trump administration a free hand to re-inject discrimination against a particular faith back into our immigration system, which was rejected more than 50 years ago. The Supreme Court's decision ignored the fact that this president and candidate has targeted a particular faith, com faith community, which is Muslims here and abroad. Unfortunately, as a nation, we still have a long way to go when it comes to equal protection and living the American ideals. But this is not the end of the road. The struggle continues. Americans historically have not relied only on the courts to create change. Mass mobilization, political awareness, and political organizing have been the tools to create change. So my message to our people that the struggle continues. We have to engage. We still have hope in our society. We have hope in our political system. And yes, we have hope in our court system. But we have more hope in our will to create change and provide equal protection for people irrespective of their faith tradition. Okay, now let's get this straight. Here's what your care guy kind of gets wrong, and this is also in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. Now, of course, this is mainly regulating what Congress can do. Congress shall have power to lay taxes, duties, imposts, excises, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, then it says to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Notice to establish a, a uniform rule of naturalization. That's really about all the Constitution states, to my knowledge, about the entire immigration policy. And when you take a look, let me see here, uh, I'm going to see if I can, U.S. Constitution, uh, I'm going to look something up real quick. Um, without getting into too much detail, what are some of the things that Congress did? They passed a Naturalization Act of 1790. They passed a Naturalization Act of 1795. They had a Naturalization Act of 1798 and 1802, 1870, 1875, 1882, 1885, 1891. And, uh, and some of these are different names like Geary Act, Immigration Act of 1891. Uh, there's also some cases mentioned here, U.S. versus Wong Kim Ark in 1898, um, Immigration Act of 1903. See, Congress has the power to enact immigration laws. That's the naturalization clause. But when you look at who and where we have, where Congress has actually restricted immigration in the past, as some of these cases and laws that I've just read off, that the president still has the power to be able to, you know, do this, even though Congress did this, that set the precedent for the president to be able to say, we're not going to do this over here, and here are the reasons why. And the reasons why are because this is all national security issues. This is areas we've been at war in, a couple of the countries that I've been to. And when I say I've been to, and making it look like it's not a good thing, I've been there as a member of the U.S. Armed Forces, carrying a rifle, wearing a helmet and a flak vest, and knowing the conditions over there, it's not fun. And this is not a walk in the park, but at the same time, there's a lot of scary people there. And the whole thing was, we need to stop bringing anybody in until we can properly vet them. That's been consistent with the Trump administration policy from day one. And the Supreme Court agreed with them. 
Care, of course, doesn't like it, but Care, obviously, they're, you know, they're just trying to do a political slant. I'm looking at what is the Constitution, what does the Constitution say, what did the court say, what did Congress say through the different immigration acts. That's what I'm looking at. Um, so now, how did our GOP lawmakers react? We heard from the Democrats earlier. Now let's look at the Republican reaction to the travel ban decision. This is one thing that just doesn't help us. Uh, we don't benefit when uh, the Islamic world sees this as a, you know, a religious test, and it doesn't help us with the war on terrorism. So uh, I do think it was institutional. I think the court, uh, um, you know, followed the law. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think it's wise. I think there's two separate issues. One is whether the president has an authority to say that there are countries that whose visa vetting systems we don't trust, and therefore we're not going to allow people to come in, and another whether it's a good idea. I think he most definitely has the authority to do it, and the question of whether it's a good idea depends on the countries that you're picking. If you're saying I'm banning a group of people because of who the people are, what your nationality is, I, I wouldn't agree with that. If what you're saying is because these countries are either broken or have been complicit, as in the case in Venezuela, of making fake travel documents, <clears throat> then there's reason to be doubtful in many cases that the person coming is actually who the document says they are. If a government is, is openly participating in creating false documents or if the creation of official documents has fallen into the hands of ISIS or some other element, you have a lot to fear about a passport produced by that nation state and, and therefore the need to, uh, to restrict travel from it until that's clarified. Uh, I'm gratified by the Supreme Court's decision this morning. The court rightly concluded that the president has full constitutional and statutory authority to defend this nation and, and in particular to restrict those coming from countries with high incidences of terrorism where, where, the, where the, the immigrants coming in cannot be properly vetted to assure whether or not they're a security threat. You have probably... What's funny is I didn't even see what... Uh... Ted Cruz or Mark Ruby had to say when I was talking. I, didn't, I actually didn't look at the clip. Uh, I, most of these I did not look. I just looked to see how long they were and then threw it in the queue. And so and I'm glad to see that Ted Cruz and Marco Ruby will agree with me because I didn't even know they were going to say that. Um, same thing, another one I haven't looked at is what did President Trump have to say about it? So here's his reaction to the ruling. You have probably all seen, otherwise you wouldn't be at the top of your game. The fact that uh, today's Supreme Court ruling uh, just coming out, a tremendous success, a tremendous victory for the American people and for our Constitution. This is a great victory for our Constitution. We have to be tough and we have to be safe and we have to be secure. At a minimum, we have to make sure that we vet people coming into the country. We know who's coming in. We know where they're coming from. The ruling shows that all of the attacks from the media and the Democrat politicians are wrong, and they turned out to be very wrong. And what we're looking for as Republicans, I can tell you, is strong borders, no crime. What the Democrats are looking at is open borders, which will bring tremendous crime. It'll bring MS-13 and lots of others that we don't want to have in our country. It'll bring tremendous crime. So I will always be defending the sovereignty, the safety, and the security of the American people. That's why I was put here. We're discussing today uh, the funding of the wall, which uh, we very much need. We started the wall. We're spending uh, a lot of energy and a lot of time and started up in San Diego and other places. It's under construction now. We have $1.6 billion. But we're going to ask for an increase in wall spending so we can finish it. Quicker. It's you have to so that is what happened with the Supreme Court decision on the travel ban. Now, we are actually going to stick with uh, President Trump real quick here because this is a side of the president that you don't see quite often. Uh, yesterday or the day, yeah, I think it was the 27th, uh, President Trump had a bunch of youth who had visited him in Washington, and he had given a speech to them. We're going to show you a short excerpt uh, about, you know, never quitting in life. You have to follow your passion. You have to do what you want to do. You have to listen to people. You have to go around and say, what's a good industry? Because I know people that love things, but 
they're behind the eight ball because they're going into something that's not a good industry. So if you can find something else, because there are industries that are so great and there are, there are places that are heading in the wrong direction and things, you want to try and be in that upslope if you can find your passion there. If you can't, still stick what you have to stick with. And I've seen people quitting. And if they would have held out longer, they would have been successful. I've seen it so much. I've seen some of the most brilliant people in the world that never made it because they were quitters. They were just quitters. They would quit. They would they just couldn't take it. They couldn't whatever. One of the things about loving what you do is that it's not work, and therefore you don't quit automatically. It's a lot easier not to quit. But you can never give up. Now, you have to also have flexibility, though. Uh, you can't necessarily say, I'm never giving up, I'm going to, and you got to be able to weave and bob. You don't have to go through a, a concrete wall when you can go over it or around it or under it or something. You have to have flexibility. You have to always be able to change course a little bit, maybe always with that same goal, but don't quit. It's be. Uh, there aren't a lot of people that have quit. You, if, you would have, if you were quitters, you probably wouldn't be here today with me, okay? You probably wouldn't be here. But never, ever quit. It kind of reminds me of Winston Churchill and never, 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 never give up. Uh, but he is absolutely right that you never quit and you don't quit in life. Um, but I'm going to transition to that because we're going to start talking about somebody who did quit. Uh, of course, keep in mind that when a Supreme Court justice at the age of 81 decides to quit, it's mainly because they've been doing the job for over 30 years and there's what little time left they have in life. You kind of want to enjoy. That's kind of the decision that Justice Anthony Kennedy had made. Uh, he, he, he was announced yesterday that he is retiring. Uh, this has been kind of in the works the last couple of years. Uh, but it has now been formalized, and he has admitted that he is retiring, uh, effective uh, a month from now. I think it's like the July 31st, I believe. So let's take a look. So now, if you look back at when Anthony Kennedy was nominated, it was the later part of the Reagan administration, you got to understand one thing. He became a, a key swing vote. Uh, later on in life, uh, there's like 25 decisions where he sided with the liberals on the court, not necessarily the conservatives. Uh, but Reagan was one of those who was seeking to get along with Democrats, try to find somebody pragmatic, somebody who we would now call you know, either a moderate or a liberal Republican. Um, but he was trying to find somebody who would have balance. To be, I mean, the Democrats controlled the U.S. Senate at the time of Anthony Kennedy's nomination, and so it was important then to get somebody who was passable through the U.S. Senate confirmation process. And Anthony Kennedy was chosen. He was not a uh, extreme conservative Republican, but he was a, still a Republican, and his record had shown that pretty consistently, but after 30, 31 years, um, he started sliding over to the left, as a lot of Republican uh, justices have done, especially when they were confirmed with a Democrat majority in the Senate. So now we're going to take a look at the impact of his retirement on the court. Just hours after the Supreme Court wrapped up their work for the summer in the courtroom, Justice Anthony Kennedy announced that he would retire effective at the end of July. Kennedy is 81 years old, the second oldest justice on the court, but more importantly, he's the justice closest to the middle of the court. And his retirement 
means that President Trump will have a second pick and a chance to really cement conservative control of the court. Trump has already said he has about two dozen candidates in mind. Most of them are federal and state Retiring. judges, some of whom he himself named to federal appeals courts. And all of those judges are expected to be, or would be, more conservative probably than Kennedy on a range of issues. There was talk that Kennedy might retire at the end of this term. And it's talk that, that, that Kennedy, uh, although asked through the court's public information office to tamp down, never did. But neither did he take any outward signs to show that he might be leaving. For instance, he hired his full allotment of four law clerks that each justice gets to have uh, in, when they're active on the bench. So that was a sign that he might be coming back. Trump has said that he wants justices who would try to overturn Roe v. Wade, the landmark decision uh, giving uh, women the right to, to have an abortion in this country. Now, the overturning Roe v. Wade may not be immediately likely, but certainly a more conservative court would probably be more willing to uphold abortion restrictions that states might pass. Trump has already uh, come out uh, in praise of Kennedy and also uh, to say that he will act quickly to uh, name his successor. When that happens, Almost, the Senate pause, will undertake uh, confirmation proceedings uh, probably before the summer is out and Republicans hold a very slim majority in the Senate but the rules in the Senate have also been changed to prevent the minority party from really uh, gumming up the works or delaying the consideration of judicial nominees. So the Democrats don't have very much that they can do anymore in the way of trying to slow down the process or require more than just the 51 votes necessary to confirm somebody. And that's actually what it had, had been done for many, many, many years was you had to have a, uh, for per Senate rules, essentially a veto-proof majority. And um, you needed to get at least 60 votes in order to pass a, to confirm a Supreme Court nomination. But then when Harry Reid, who was the Democrat, former majority leader of the U.S. Senate, changed the rule for judicial appointments at, uh, for other federal levels, then you had Mitch McConnell who changed the rules for the Supreme Court. Now it's a simple 51 uh, vote majority for confirmation, and whoever the president selects will probably get um, passed. So I'm just going to read off a list of names. These are the names, because one of these will probably pop out. I'm not going to go through their biographies, because I just don't have time. Uh, but the list of names that the president has released that he will most likely select from when um, he makes his choice. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett, Keith Blackwell, Charles Kennedy, Stephen Colleton, Ellison Ide, Britt Grant, Raymond Grunder, Thomas Hardiman, Brett Kavanaugh, Raymond Kethridge, Joan Larson, Mike Lee, Thomas Lee, Edward Mansfield, uh, Federico Marino, Kevin Newsom, William Pryor, Margaret Ryan, David Strauss, David Strauss is uh, formerly on the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, Diane Sykes, Emil Thapar, uh, Timothy Timkovich, Don Willett, Patrick Wyrick, and Robert Young. These are the people who most likely will be selected. Uh, some of them, like Robert Young, he's a uh, retired Michigan Supreme Court justice. Age 67, he will probably not get chosen. Whereas Patrick Wyrick of Oklahoma is only 37, he would probably be more in consideration. Uh, some others that are in the 60s, others in the 40s, a couple in the 50s. I think it's going to be somewhere around the 40 to 50 year olds that are going to be uh, chosen because the, this is the one area that the president, regardless of who it is or what the party is, this is the one area historically that they can leave a long and lasting legacy uh, after their term of service has concluded. So uh, let's talk about uh, President Trump. He said he's going to immediately start hunting for a new justice. That's happened before. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to have the president and highly respected, I must say, president of Portugal with us. Uh, we have a tremendous relationship with Portugal for a long time, and I would say it's never been better than it is right now. So uh, I just want to uh, welcome you and your delegation. It's, uh, it is uh, a country of great beauty and great people. And so thank you, and if you don't mind, I, I'll just make a quick statement of 
a man I also have great respect for, Justice Anthony. You know who I'm talking about. Justice Kennedy will be uh, retiring, and he is a man that uh, I've known for a long time and a man that I've respected for a long time. He's been a great justice of the Supreme Court. He, uh, he is uh, a man who is displaying great vision. He's displayed tremendous vision and tremendous heart. And he will be missed, uh, but he will be retiring. And we will begin our search for a new justice of the United States Supreme Court that will begin immediately. And hopefully, we're going to pick somebody who will be as outstanding. So I just want to uh, thank Justice Kennedy for the years of tremendous service. Uh, he's a, uh, a very spectacular man, really a spectacular man. And I know that he will be around, hopefully, for a long time to advise. And, and uh, I believe he's going to be teaching and doing other things. So thank you to Justice Kennedy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, we have, uh, obviously, uh, numerous people. We have a list of 25 people that I actually had during my election. I had to 20, and as you know, I added five uh, a little while ago. Uh, we have a, a very uh, excellent list of great talented, highly educated, highly intelligent, hopefully uh, uh, tremendous people. I think the list is very outstanding. When I was running, I, I put down uh, a list of 20 people. Because not being a politician, I think people wanted to uh, hear what some of my choices may be. And it was pretty effective. And um, I think you see the kind of quality that we're looking at when you look at that list. Uh, but I, I did add, I added five uh, additional people to the list. So it will be somebody from that list. So we have now boiled it down to about 25 people. Of the names that I had just read to you. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, what does he have to say about the process for confirmation? Mr. President, we recently received news that Justice Anthony Kennedy will be retiring, leaving a vacancy on the nation's highest court. This is the most important Supreme Court vacancy for this country in at least a generation. Nothing less than the fate of our health care system, reproductive rights for women, and countless other protections for middle-class Americans are at stake. Will Republicans and President Trump nominate and vote for someone who will preserve protections for people with pre-existing conditions? Or will they support a justice who will put health insurance companies over patients or put the federal government between a woman and her doctor. The Senate should reject, on a bipartisan basis, any justice who would overturn Roe v. Wade or undermine key health care protections. The Senate should reject anyone who will instinctively side with powerful special interests over the interests of average Americans. Our Republican colleagues in the Senate should follow the rule they set in 2016, not to consider a Supreme Court justice in an election year. Senator McConnell would tell anyone who listened that the Senate had the right to advise and consent, and that was every bit as important as the President's right to nominate. Millions of people are just months away from determining the senators who should vote to confirm or reject the president's nominee, and their voices deserve to be heard now, as Leader McConnell thought they should deserve to be heard then. Anything but that would be the absolute height of hypocrisy. People from all across America should realize that their rights and opportunities are threatened. Americans should make their voices heard loudly, clearly, and consistently. Americans should make it clear that they will not tolerate a nominee chosen from President Trump's preordained list 
selected by powerful special interests who will reverse the progress we have made over the decades. I yield the floor. Okay, I'm going to briefly address Senator Schumer about the McConnell rule, which, of course, is a derivative of the Biden rule. The reason why the Neil Gorsuch nomination occurred instead of the Merrick Garland nomination, and we've covered this on this program, is because President Obama was a lame duck president in an election year, meaning that this was the last year because of term limits that it made sense to wait until after the election. The next time you're going to have that kind of scenario play out will be 2024 if President Trump gets reelected. Because in 2025, a new president will be inaugurated. That goes back to our Constitution. That is the reason why that, uh, uh, that was uh, applicable. But even if the Democrats do get the Senate in, in this November, guess what? Trump's still president. He's still going to be able to give the nomination. Therefore, Senator Schumer does not have a valid point here. Uh, we're going to give you Senator Mitch McConnell's response. Without objection. Mr. President, just a few moments ago, Justice Anthony Kennedy announced that he is retiring as an associate justice of the U.S. Supreme Court and taking senior status effective July 31st. First and foremost, I want to pause and express our gratitude for the extraordinary service that Justice Kennedy has offered our nation. He served on the federal bench for 43 years. In particular, we owe him a debt of thanks for his ardent defense of the First Amendment and the First Amendment's right to political speech. As Justice Kennedy concludes his tenure on the court, we wish him, his wife Mary, and their family every happiness in the years ahead. The Senate stands ready to fulfill its constitutional role by offering advice and consent on President Trump's nominee to fill this vacancy. We will vote to confirm Justice Kennedy's successor this fall. It's imperative that the President's nominee be considered fairly and not subjected to personal attacks. Thus far, President Trump's judicial nominations have reflected a keen understanding of the vital role that judges play in our constitutional order. Judges must interpret the law fairly and apply it even-handedly. Judicial decisions must not flow from judges' personal philosophies or preferences, but from an honest assessment of the words and actual meaning of the law. And so that was Senator Mitch McConnell. Now, I hope you kind of notice, this goes kind of trying to tie back in with how we started here about American media, Soviet tactics. Did you notice who Senator Schumer was in the chamber with on the floor of the U.S. Senate? Nobody except one staffer by his side. Did you notice who was there? Senator Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader. I'm being equal, evenly handed here. He was speaking in front of an empty chamber. That's what happens. They come in, they know the TV cameras are there, they have their prepared speech, they read the speech uh, like they're addressing the body. There's nobody there. That's all for your edification. We showed you these clips on TV back to back, but now watch what the mainstream media does with this story. We have shown you responses for both the travel ban and the uh, Supreme Court vacancy. We have shown you the responses from the Republicans, from the Democrats, from other core constituencies. Now, watch how you're going to see only one side play out on, in your newspaper and on the national news. Anyhow, for Dallas Pearson producer, I'm Jeff Williams, the host of North Star Oasis. With 179 shopping days left till Christmas, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.